I'm so glad that you've tuned in to one of the sermons from St Mary's. If you're new to our church and would like to find out more about being involved, please visit our website and drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. Then I saw another portent in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is ended. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the Lamb. Great and amazing are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your judgments have been revealed. After this, I looked, and the temple of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels with seven plagues, robed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes across their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden globes, full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were ended. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let me add my welcome to Tom's uh, this morning. Really good to see you. Thank you for uh, Maureen and James for reading for us as we stand. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for your words that we've just heard. Thank you for this morning and this space to gather together before you. Thank you that as we put our minds on what is true and what is praiseworthy and what is excellent, thank you that we give you pleasure. And so we pray that by your spirit, you would be with us this morning and guide us into all truth as we look at Jesus together. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, do take a seat. Uh, and you'd have noticed from our reading this morning that uh, Revelation is getting no less challenging uh, as we work our way through it. Well done for sticking with it. We recognise that Revelation is a little bit of a marathon uh, and we're just around the Cutty Sark, if you think of the London Marathon. So well done for sticking with it, even when the going is a little bit cobbly. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that what we're going to be concentrating on this morning is all of the good news that we can get out of that passage that we've just read together. So this morning is a story of good news. And I guess as we look at today's world, we really find ourselves in need of good news uh, in uh, what so often is a bad news world. Um, I guess it's a bad news world unless you're living in Russia at the moment where my suspicions are that the news channels are filled with a sense of good news at the moment. You might be aware of the fact that uh, rather famously, the news channels and the media outlets in Russia are not allowed to talk about the war. Uh, it's a special uh, operation. I've got a slightly irreverent image in my mind of Putin rushing around the Kremlin like Basil Fawlty, telling everybody, don't talk about the war, don't mention the war. Um, but it's serious, isn't it? One of Putin's MPs used the platform of the Russian parliament to describe this special operation in Ukraine as, quotes, maintaining peace. Uh, that was in the debate where the parliament voted through a law making uh, the spreading of inverted commas fake news about this special peacekeeping operation punishable by 15 years in prison. And all of that was less than a month after President Putin had declared to the world that the build up of Russian troops on the border with Ukraine was nothing 
to be worried about, and he wasn't planning an invasion. And state media in Russia had broadcast pictures of Russia supposedly removing tanks on trains from around the border. Now, UK Defence Secretary Ben Wallace last week, writing in the uh, Telegraph, explained the Russian concept of Vriano. I'm not sure whether you've come across that or read the article. Vriano, this is how he described it. It's when I lie to you and when you know I'm lying to you and when I know that you know that I'm lying to you, but I still lie anyway, because lying is about exerting power. It's like claiming that two men that visited Salisbury to smear a weapons grade nerve agent on the door handle of somebody they wanted to assassinate were visiting the cathedral because they liked its spire. And so in a world of fake news and bad news, and downright lies, is there any reliable good news? Uh, and that's what we're going to focus on in looking at this passage in Revelation this morning. It was page 277. It would be really helpful, as it has been over the last uh, few weeks, uh, to have that passage open in front of you. Page 277, Revelation 15 and 16, because the answer to the question, is there any good news around and is there any reliable news around, <laughs> is yes, which is, which is great. Uh, we're going to look at three bits of good news uh, in the next few moments together. And a bit of good news, uh, number one, is that we all carry a name. Uh, we all carry, if we follow Jesus Christ and remain faithful to him, we carry his name. At the beginning of chapter 15, we read this. Then I saw another portent in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels. You're picking up the theme of the seven, seven trumpets, uh, seven seals. We're now with seven angels, with seven plagues, which are the last. So we've got the idea that this sequence of these lots of sevens that's been circling around Revelation uh, is coming to its climax. Uh, for with them the wrath of God is ended. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name were standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God or harps of gold in their hands. Now we've already met those worshippers. We met them in chapter 14, verse 1, just uh, a few chapters. Uh, earlier. And in that verse, here's what the writer John says. He says, then I looked and there was the Lamb, Jesus, standing on Mount Zion. And with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name on their foreheads. Now, to the Jews, you might be aware the forehead is a really special place. Uh, it, you might still sometimes see Orthodox Jews with little leather boxes, phylacteries they're called, um, which where they have part of the law of God written inside and they bind it to their, their foreheads. Um, it's, a, it's an Old Testament command for God's Jewish people to, to bind the law of God to themselves. It's, it, it's their identifier, if you like. And the New Testament tells us that Christians who follow Jesus are identified by having his name, uh, the Father's name, uh, on their foreheads. It's what we do at the moment of christening when we name somebody as well and sign them with the, the sign of the cross. Uh, it's as if uh, we've said to all those people who have said, God, would you please save me through the sacrifice of your lamb, Jesus, sacrificed on the cross for us. It's the, that moment at which we're identified in God through Jesus. Now that is, that is really good news, to be known as a child of God. The correlating news is that not everyone is known as a child of God. There's a, there's a different father out there in creation as well, who in the Bible is known as the father of lies, uh, Satan. Uh, we heard in chapter 15, verse 2 in our reading, that there is 
an evil beast. The number of that beast is 666. It might be that all these numbers in Revelation, and particularly that number, uh, is filled with a certain either confusion uh, or fear. Um, this number is quite an interesting number in uh, Revelation. I'm not sure when you were at, at school, whether perhaps at primary school, whether you ever played the kind of game of, of first realising what codes were and simple codes, kind of A equals one and B equals two and C equals three and so on. And you, and you sort of, you, you wrote down a little code for your neighbour. Uh, on the wall in Pompeii, there's some graffiti that's been discovered, and it's a young male lover declaring his love for this woman, but he wants to do it slightly secretly for whatever his reasons were. And he says, I love the woman whose number is 315, which, which, which sort of sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? But we sort of know what he's going on about. He's turned her name into uh, a number. Uh, Greek scholars looking at Revelation have suggested that the number 666 corresponds uh, in Greek to the Roman emperor Nero and to his name. Uh, Nero was persecuting Christians at the time that John was writing down his vision. You might know that Nero had, had uh, set a fire in Rome to destroy part of the city so that he could build an enormous palace. Uh, and uh, he'd made Christians in Rome the scapegoats for that fire. He'd blamed them, and then he'd fed them to lions in the Colosseum, uh, or at least uh, in uh, one of the stadiums in Rome at that point. Uh, and Nero's end is fascinating. He ended up taking his own life, having been condemned by his own parliament. Uh, and there's really nothing new under the sun. We look back in the last century and we see Hitler taking his own life as the condemnation of years of war poured down on him. And history is littered with a succession of tyrants. If Putin thought he was new, uh, he certainly isn't. There are plenty of people before him who have shown that there is a father of lies and that people who follow the father of lies meet a sticky end. How is that uh, good news for us uh, today? I think the good news that I'm taking away from that um, is that you can't bury the truth. Uh, the truth won't die. Uh, the truth won't be silent. There are plenty of brave people in Russia today uh, and many disorientated Russians living in this country and around the world who are standing up against their president when he blatantly lies. Uh, we need to pray for them. We need to pray for the more than 4,000 who were arrested last weekend for standing up and telling the truth in Russia. We need to pray for their families. Uh, we need to pray that courage would stir in the hearts of the Russian parliament so that when MPs stand up, they don't merely repeat Putin's lies, but they actually tell him he's wrong. Uh, and we need to pray for Christians, both in Russia and Ukraine and a world around the world, who are meeting this morning in the name of the Father of Truth. Now, it's not just at Salisbury Cathedral that's been in the news. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I switched on the news at lunchtime to see uh, the Ukrainian interior minister, the Home Secretary equivalent, uh, and he was in uh, Kiev Cathedral. Uh, and he'd gone along there at midday to pray. Uh, and as part of that prayer service, he was prayed for and he received a blessing from uh, one of the Ukrainian army chaplains. I don't know in any way what the Ukrainian army chaplain prayed for him, but I wonder if he used these words from Numbers 6. Uh, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. I want to think that and pray that prayer for Ukraine and Russian Christians this morning. And this is how the passage ends. So they will put my name upon the Israelites and bless them. 
we all carry a name. It's either the name of the father of truth or the father of lies. And the second bit of good news that we encounter in uh, Revelation is that judgment will take place and it's going to be just and it's going to be true. Uh, the Bible reassures us that there isn't going to be anyone stood there on the day of judgment saying to God, well, I, I think you missed that bit. You didn't see what was going on over there. Or um, I think you've got that wrong, God. You, you've been a bit unfair there. Right? I don't really like how you've treated this. The Bible reassures us that when we see what God is doing on judgment day, we will be going, amen, this is good news. Your judgments are great and true. Chapter 15, verse 3, has already told us that. If you look down, uh, you'll see in verse 3 that it celebrates as a hymn of praise uh, to God's just judgments. And then chapter 16, verse 5, takes up the same kind of refrain. You are just, O holy one, for you are and were, for you have judged these things. And I heard the altar respond. You might remember the saints of God, those who carry God's name, are sheltering under the protection of his altar. I heard the altar respond. Yes, O Lord God, the almighty, your judgments are true and just. Chapter 16 goes on to show us that although God's wrath and judgment is just, and although it's clearly coming, and although there are plenty of opportunities for those who don't yet carry the name of Jesus to repent and to respond, they, they refuse to do so. Have a look at chapter 16, verse 9. You see there, they cursed the name of God. Even in the middle of all this meltdown, they cursed the name of God who had authority over these plagues. And they did not repent or give him glory. And just in case we've missed the point, verse 11 and they cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. We long, don't we, for justice. Uh, we long for ourselves and others. We recognize that the problem with the world, the heart of the human problem, is the problem of the human heart. And that's not just Putin's heart, it's my heart and your hearts as well. We long to be people of integrity and people of purity. We long for justice. We long to turn away from our sins. It's why our services start off with a moment of confession. We, we long to know God's forgiveness, to, to be protected from his wrath. Uh, it's something that we pray for ourselves. It's something that we pray for Putin. I, I, I must admit, I was challenged by Boris Johnson's remarks in the last week. Um, I understand why he said what he said, but I don't think he's got it quite right. Uh, he said his main point of British foreign policy at the moment is that Putin needs to fail. This is a quote. Putin needs to fail and he needs to be seen to fail. And I really get what he's saying there. I really get the sentiment of it. But the Christian message is ultimately one of redemption. The Christian question is, what does redemption look like in any given situation? What does redemption look like? Uh, repentance, that word that we've been looking at in verses 9 and 11, means to turn around. The world, many Russians included, is longing for Putin to repent, uh, to turn from the father of lies to the father of truth, to turn his troops and his army around, uh, to embrace truth, to turn not just on an earthly practical level, to actually turn to Jesus, to turn to the one who really offers redemption. That doesn't mean to say that there won't be consequences to face. It doesn't mean to say that there won't be a whole load of mess in every way, emotionally, practically, and spiritually to clear up. But the world is longing for Putin to turn around. I wonder how we offer the hope, not just of failure, but the, the hope of redemption. It would be the bravest thing in the world, the strongest thing that this so-called strong man in Russia could do, 
to turn his troops around and to leave the country. That, would be, that wouldn't be failure. That would be real strength and courage. And I wonder whether we need to offer Putin the seeds of a message of redemption that comes through repentance and is still going to have consequences, but actually is the strong and the right and the good thing to do. Because Salisbury Cathedral isn't the only cathedral that's been in the news and Kiev Cathedral isn't the only cathedral. I, there were also Ukrainian reports last week of Kharkiv uh, in the east of the country, the cathedral in that city being damaged by shell fire. And President Zelensky said in response to that shelling, you cannot hide from God. Mr. Putin, God sees. And so the good news is that justice will be done and that the offer of redemption, albeit phenomenally complicated, is there. And that leads us to at the point that we'll uh, land on uh, this morning, that uh, although there is wrath and judgment, uh, there is a safe corridor to peace that's been uh, opened up. Whatever we've done, God's provided an exit strategy, not just for you and for me, but for the whole world. And it's an exit strategy which satisfies the justice requirements of the heavenly court of justice. And it's also a route that leads from death to life. Just have a look at how chapter 16 finishes. Verse 17 of chapter 16 says this, the seventh angel poured his bowl into the air and a loud voice came from the temple, from the throne saying, it is done. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and a violent earthquake such as had not occurred since people were on the earth. So violent was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. God remembered great Babylon and gave her the wine cup of the fury of his wrath. <laughs> you, you might be asking, how is that good news? Let me tell you. Uh, sin and injustice and uh, everything that is wrong and bad deserve and demand justice and judgment. It is right that on Judgment Day, what is going on at the moment will come before the throne of God and the question will be, and how are we going to judge that? Or how are you going to judge that, Lord? And what Revelation is reminding us here is that the burden of the wrath of that judgment on sin has been poured out on Jesus in our place. You might remember that when Jesus prayed before he went to the cross, he said, please, Father, could you take this, quote, cup of suffering from me? So when this cup is being poured out, the wine cup of the fury of God's wrath, what we're remembering is this. We're remembering that on the cross, the wine cup of the fury of God's wrath was poured out on Jesus. The judgment, the anger for the sins of the world and everything that's going on at the moment and everything that we've done personally, that's all been poured out on Jesus and he's taken that on himself. Just in the same way that Revelation 16 says, it is done. You might remember Jesus declaring from the cross, it is finished. Revelation talks about an earthquake. Matthew talks about an earthquake. Revelation talks about the city being divided. Matthew talks about the city being divided by this earthquake and the tombs opening up and holy people being seen to walk about in the city of Jerusalem following Jesus's resurrection as he was raised to eternal life. There are two choices. We either carry the name of Jesus and accept that God has poured out the wine cup of his fury on him, or we persist in our lies and we say that we will 
accept the consequences of that and that the wine cup of God's fury will be poured out on us. That's the world that Revelation is presenting us with. And it's a world of true news, not fake news and good news, uh, not bad news, that the Lord Almighty is the king of the nations, not Putin, whatever he might think, and that God is just and true. That revelation reminds us that justice will be done against all sin and deceit and lies. And revelation reminds us that for all who repent, Jesus has borne God's wrath so that we might carry his name and live in him forever. Uh, this really is, it's not easy news, uh, but it is deeply good news. Amen. <laughs>